Welcome to Takeshi's Bench, where you can discuss all things philosophical. In this episode, I'd like to explain what kinds of philosophy there are, especially to those of you who are interested in taking philosophy courses but not sure where to begin. This information is also incidentally useful for those who are trying to have a conversation with philosophy students or philosophy specialists. Now, when people ask me, what do you do for a living? I always say that I'm a philosopher. But then we always get stuck with the next question. What kind of philosophy do you do? Well, I say, I'm a specialist of comparative and Japanese philosophy. But that means nothing to most people. And even to some philosophers, this answer is quite questionable. So in this episode, I'd like to show you what kinds of philosophy you can study at the universities and beyond, or give you a map of what's actually going on in the field of philosophy. If you look at the field of philosophy, there are three different groups of people. The first is called analytical continental philosophy divide. The second is history of philosophy. And then remaining minorities will be labeled under this beautiful language of the others in this episode. Now, majority of us, uh, most of the philosophy students and philosophy scholars belong to this first camp of analytic or continental philosophy divide. Uh, I would say 90% of us actually work in either in analytic or continental philosophy, philosophical field. And then uh, 10% of us actually belong, would say that we are specializing in the, in, in the field of history of philosophy. Uh, they are not necessarily subscribing to this divide between analytical and continental philosophy and differentiates them from the majority of the people. Uh, actually, history of philosophy has a much longer tradition than the divide between analytical and continental philosophy, uh, but the number of people who actually belongs to this second camp would be probably 10%. Now, remaining others, if you talk to 100 philosophy specialists, maybe you'll be able to find one or two people that actually belongs to these subjects. Uh, these subjects cannot belong to the history of philosophy or analytic or continental philosophy in the pre at present. Now, I would say 90% for the analytic or continental, 10% for history of philosophy, and 2% for the, the category of the others. Uh, these numbers don't add up. Uh, precisely because these categories are not mutually exclusive. So it's possible for you to do a history of philosophy in much more analytic uh, fashion or continental fashion, or you do history of philosophy with the intent to incorporate uh, the categories of the others. So let's take a look at the first category of analytic or continental philosophy. In a field of philosophy, you either study analytic or continental philosophy. So the division between these two is quite stark, in a sense that the continental philosophers won't be able to understand what analytic philosophers are doing, and analytic philosophers are unlikely to read the text written by continental philosophers. Now, this, there are some people who can actually read both texts at the same time, but the, uh, they are quite rare uh, because of the differences of the ways in which analytic and continental philosophers do philosophy. So let me briefly describe in the following the differences between the two. Now, analytic philosophers use formal logical language to lay out the structure of arguments in any philosophical text, and then they tend to focus on problem solving. So if you open the book and you see mathematical symbols in the core of the argument, 99% of the time you're reading analytic philosophers' text, and if that text says the problem in this text is this, right? The theme of this book is this problem, and I'm solving this problem by the end of this book, that is 100% analytic philosophy text. Because of the use of formal logical language, analytic philosophers tend to focus less on historical context, that pay attention to the structure of arguments rather than the historical context in which these problems are raised. Uh, because of this style, analytic philosophers' texts tend to be concise and quite clear. Uh, so even though I belong to the continental philosophy circle, uh, I quite like having conversation with analytic philosophers because their argument is concise and they tell me what they think, right? So they say, problem is this, my solution to the problem is this. Uh, so it's quite enjoyable to have a conversation with analytic philosophers. Now, I said uh, this either or of analytic and continental divide is the majority of philosophy population in the world. Uh, but within that majority, I said analytic philosopher is a dominant group. Uh, the ratio between analytic and continental philosophy would be something like um, 7 to 3 or maybe 4 to 1. Uh, I think the divide is becoming wider today. Uh, 
so there are much more analytic philosophers in the world than continental philosophers. Uh, but if you pay attention to the origin of each camp, you'll be able to actually find more people in that original uh, place. So Anglo-American intellectual tradition is the origin of analytic philosophy. So if you go to UK or North America, you'll be able to find far more analytic philosophers than continental philosophers. Now, continental philosophy uh, originates from Germany and France, roughly, uh, or continental Europe. Therefore, if you go to Germany or France, you'll be able to find more continental philosophers. Uh, although I heard that less and less people actually study continental philosophy and more analytic philosophers are available even in Germany and France. Uh, now, continental philosopher uses, uh, philosophers use very complex language. Uh, so their sentences structure tend to be really complex. Sometimes they use rhetorical device or poetic languages. Uh, sometimes even um, grammatically incorrect sentences to make a point. Uh, so, uh, you know, in opposed to analytic philosophy, where once you master the phonological language, you'll be able to read anybody's paper. A continental philosophy requires different sets of commitment to different groups of a continental philosophy. Uh, also, continental philosophers tend to question the ways in which the problems are set up in the history of philosophy. So, they question the questions. Uh, so, they are not interested in solving the problems, but they are actually interested in the ways in which the problems are raised. Because of this, they have to pay attention to the historical context in each philosophical text that is written. And, because, and also because of this uh, commitment to the ph massive ph philological work, their works tend to be long and also sometimes cryptic. So if you have a conversation with a continental philosopher and their sentences are quite long and cryptic uh, or sometimes even incomprehensible, uh, you're, you, you can be assured that you're actually having a conversation with a continental philosopher. And as I said, the, uh, the, the group of continental philosophers is actually a minority in the field of philosophy. Now, history of philosophy. I said 10% of the world philosophy population was identified themselves as studying the history of philosophy. Uh, it's about the intellectual history of humanity, but be careful. By intellectual history of humanity, they mean intellectual history of Europe and North America. Maybe North America. So sometimes they don't even include North America into the intellectual history of humanity. Now that means that your program is actually going to study from Plato to Heidegger, May, and then maybe even Heideggerians in 20th century philosophy. That means after Plato, you have to study Aristotle. After Aristotle, you study Augustine, Aquinas. And then you move to the modern philosophy of uh, René Descartes, right? And then Spinoza, who took the Cartesian philosophy to the next level. And then you study the Copernican revolution of Kant. And then you study Hegelian dialectics and suddenly good looking existentialism by Kierkegaard before move on to. Uh, Marxism, um, which completes with Heidegger and Heideggerian philosophy. Now, intellectual history or history of philosophy department uh, usually can be found in Catholic schools because they have this sort of historical narrative of seeing the history of humanity as a single stream of human thinking. Uh, also, liberal arts schools that uh, try to pay attention to the whole of intellectual history. Now, Often the criticism that intellectual history or his, uh, history of philosophy department receives is that they're heavily focusing on the history of white European male. Now, this is not quite true because Augustine, for instance, is North African. So this racial profile is not necessarily accurate to describe the actual history of philosophy. But the criticism is that it does pay attention to the uh, history of male thinkers. So there are quite a number of intellectual uh, figures that are marginalized from history of philosophy. Which takes us to the final category of the marginalized others. Uh, I like to label them as a massive minority. Now, I mentioned in the beginning that the number of people who are engaged in these subjects is quite small, something like 2% or less of the entire philosophy population in the world. But I like to call them massive in a sense that the, the amount of intellectual resources available for them is quite massive. So uh, we need more people actually working in this field. First group of people uh, are the comparative philosophy specialists in this massive minority. Uh, 
uh, somewhere in the 1970s in the United States, uh, some scholars started to pay attention that there might be some intellectual traditions that we should pay attention to beyond the confines of the Western intellectual traditions. So they pay attention to Asia. Uh, first, we have a comparative philosophy on the East and West, which means they started to pay attention to Confucianism, Hinduism, and Buddhism. In some cases, Oriental philosophy includes Islamic philosophy, uh, precisely because Islamic philosophy is not well studied within the confines of European intellectual tradition. Um, some philosophers, like Derrida from Contemporary Philosophy, argues that Islamic philosophy should be included within the confines of European intellectual tradition because they are based on the same Abrahamic faith. Um, but that is quite questionable, and also the uh, current state of academic philosophy is quite clear that we are not studying uh, Islamic philosophy at the same way as we study Judeo-Christian philosophical tradition. Uh, therefore, I think it's safe to actually include in this the category of Muslim minority at the moment. Uh, once you started to pay attention to Asia or Eastern intellectual traditions beyond the confines of European or Western intellectual tradition, logical question after this is like is what happens to what happened to the rest of the world basically, right? So uh, people started to pay attention to the south, southern philosophy in opposed to northern hemisphere in a sense that they started to pay attention to African philosophy. Uh, that is not a single philosophy, it's various intellectual traditions in Africa. And also uh, people started to pay attention to Latin American philosophy. So now you have comparative philosophy that includes not only Asian philosophical traditions, but African uh, Latin American and even Polynesian, uh, such as Maori philosophy, into these comparative philosophical discussions. Now, the problem with comparative philosophy is that you have to have Western philosophy as a point of reference. Therefore, it's very difficult for comparative philosophers to talk about non-Western concepts with non-Western concepts. You always have to compare non-Western concepts with Western concepts. Uh, this means that the comparative philosophy also suffers from a kind of Eurocentrism. So if you want to talk about Japanese philosophy and Maori philosophy, you know, if you pay attention to the notion of reality in Maori philosophy and Zen Buddhism, there's rich possibilities of many different ideas. But we can't do this in the context of comparative philosophy because we have to bypass, we cannot bypass Western philosophy. So what happened over the last 10 years or so is this development of the world philosophies. What world philosophies does by refusing to use the singular form of philosophy is to make the decentralized study of multiple intellectual traditions possible. That is to say, in the context of world philosophies, you can actually study non-Western intellectual tradition in its own right and compare that concept with any other intellectual traditions. So you can do comparative philosophy with or without Western philosophy in the context of world philosophies. Now, one group that I haven't talked about uh, in relation to the massive minority is feminist philosophy. It is quite clear that in relation to the first and second category, feminist philosophy should be included in a massive minority. But we have to actually put a risk. Uh, I think feminist philosophy, when it's properly done, I think it should be part of this group. Uh, but if the feminist philosophy actually pays attention to only European white women's philosophical voice to be part of the European intellectual canon, it would become something that opposed to a massive minority. Uh, so I have heard some comparative philosophers or war philosophers talking, uh, criticizing feminist philosophy from the perspective of non-Western philosophical traditions. So we would have to actually see how feminist develops. And of course, feminist philosophy is one of the most important topics in contemporary society. And I do think that we need to pay attention to where it's going and it should be discussed in a separate episode. On that note, you can actually see how three different categories are uh, are in the field of philosophy. So we can actually go back to the beginning of this episode. So when somebody asks me a question, what do you do for a living? I say I'm a philosopher. They ask me, what kind of philosophy do you study? Now you know my answer. I'm a comparative and Japanese philosophy specialist. And unlike the beginning, you'll be able to actually put me on this map and then see where I stand in relation to the whole three 
categories of philosophy. If you made it to this far, you should definitely like this video, and if you are interested in philosophy, please subscribe to this channel to catch this bench. If you have any questions about philosophy or comments, arguments, counterarguments, ideas, or pipe dreams on all things philosophical, please feel free to send them to us through comments, and we will try to pick some of them for the future episodes. Thanks again for watching, and see you next time. Mm -hmm.